elements come from? And the answer is that they're fused in the centers, in the cores of stars. And massive stars in particular are very efficient at this. They fuse lower elements like hydrogen and helium into heavier elements, and then they explode in supernova explosions, and they spew that material out into their local environment so the next generation of stars can pull that in as they're forming. Those are the kind of things that form rocky planets like the Earth, where we've got like an iron core and all those elements in our atmospheres. Those were fused in earlier generations of stars. So Arendelle is this single star, the farthest yet that we've been able to observe, and it will allow us to see how that process started to be put together in the very earliest days. When did those very early heavy elements start to be infused into the material? And it's just a, a window that's opening up onto you know, the next big thing because that light is pushed so far into the red that we need a telescope that can go even further into the red than Hubble can to really uncover the cool things. Yeah, and speaking of, I think <laughs> another fantastic part about all of this is that there's already approved observations to look at Arendelle with the recently launched James Webb Space Telescope, which is a super powerful infrared space telescope that just launched in December. We're so excited for it to begin science operations this summer. And Jane, could you kind of tell us how uh, Webb might bring this Hubble discovery even farther? Sure. So I learned about this, this lens star when the, the discoverers came to me, said, so do you want to be, we're, we're trying to figure out how to plan some web observations. Are you in? I'm like, oh, I'm totally in. That's cool. So what we worked out was a set of observations with NearCam, which is the, the, Im the near-infrared imager, to get uh, colors in all of those filters that are too red for Hubble to do well, right, or to do it all, right? And so, it, so Web will pick up where Hubble left off, getting redder filters, so we'll have very crisp, gorgeous images. We've already proven with Webb that we can take gorgeous images It's very, as a very, very sharp telescope, and now we're getting the science instruments ready to go. The second science instrument that we will target for this, uh, for this galaxy and star is NearSpec, the Near Infrared Spectrograph. And so we'll be taking spectra of not only the, the lensed galaxy, the Sunrise Arc, but also the star Arendelle. And so the NearSpec has a lot of cool bells and whistles. One of them is it has this micro shutter array that has a quarter of a million doors that can open and close magnetically. And so we are, we'll open up doors, um, we'll close most of them so we don't get the, the brightness of the sky in the way, and then we'll just open some doors for the lens galaxy and for Arendelle the star. And we'll be getting spectra, right, with a little prism to tell us about what's inside of those, what's inside that galaxy. What is the temperature of that star? How bright is it really? How, as Patty was talking about, how, many, what, how, how much of the heavier elements that were made in stars are in this galaxy versus just the boring hydrogen and helium that's made in the Big Bang? Okay, gotcha. And so more broadly speaking, why is it important that both Hubble and Webb are going to be operating at the same time? Sure, so Hubble and Webb are really complementary. They're, they're not really in competition. When we built Webb, we knew full well there was a Hubble up there doing great stuff, and we didn't try to replicate that functionality. So it's really like players in a band, like you know, your drummer and your keyboardist are doing different things. And so you, you select them for different skills. So Web is really designed to do the things that Hubble can't. It has much greater spectroscopic capabilities than Hubble, so we can really see what the universe is made of which is great because that's, that's part of what, I, what, I, what my research is. I love spectroscopy. What's stuff made of? Um, and then the other part is that we're operating in the infrared with Webb. So we're looking, the bluest light that Webb can see is like a dusky red, like, a, like red wine. And then it just gets redder from there, right? So whereas Hubble can see um, into the near infrared, and then it can see into pretty hard into the ultraviolet, like bluer than cats or bees can see. Okay, yeah, it's gonna be really great. I'm very excited for them both to be working together up there. And uh, back to Hubble, Patty, could you just sort of tell us how Hubble's doing these days? How long we can expect it to last? <laughs> sure, absolutely. So Hubble is actually doing great. And it was launched in 1990, so it's coming up on its 32nd birthday in space. That is a long time for an observatory to be in space. Uh, but it's in a low Earth orbit, and its orbit was chosen so that it could be uh, rendezvoused with the space shuttle and astronauts could actually grab it and bring it back into the bay there and service it. What servicing meant was that it could refurbish the instruments, refurbish the computer, the power systems, and this was done five times during the lifetime of Hubble. 
During the last servicing mission, the astronauts worked very hard to leave the telescope